difficult, frustrating, intimidating. These are words that flash through the average gamer's mind when they hear the name from software. Since the release of Dark Souls in 2011, from software have quickly made themselves a household name, known for producing games with unforgiving difficulty and just as cryptic stories. These games are equal parts revered and feared. From the outside looking in, they seem to have a Midas touch, every game as of late becoming an instant classic, and at worst, receiving Game of the Year. But why do their fans keep coming back? eager for punishment, time and time again. Is dying over and over really all that fun? Founded in 1986, but producing their first game in 1994, From Software has persevered and overcome. Building trust within a small community, their tireless effort has blossomed into the recognition they have always deserved, but were never given. Nowadays, From Software is more popular than ever, a titan with eyes the world over glued to their every move. But this wasn't always the case. With the return of their once popular Armored Core franchise, I thought a look back was in order for those who have only just joined us, or perhaps those yet interested. So humor me a little, and join me in this expansive celebration of everything From Software, where we will see what's changed and how much has stayed the same. There's more to this company than crushing difficulty. Prepare to die. And by that I mean myself. I must have lost my mind. In this video series will offer an in-depth look at every game from software has ever developed. Developed being the key word. I will not be covering games they only published, like the Tenchu series. Which, while a shame, as I really enjoy Tenchu, this will be long enough as is. Of course, here is a preemptive spoiler warning. I will cover a game's development, explain the premise, and cover gameplay first, moving on to the real meat of the story after. If a game interests you, and you wish to experience it firsthand, then simply skip to the next game. But if you're someone who will never touch an old game, regardless of any attempts on my behalf, then the long story spoilers are for you. We don't really need any more armchair experts in this sphere, but on the off chance that something sparks even the tiniest bit of interest in these old games, then it was worth it in the end. Probably. From software games typically focus more on gameplay, and feature a light-handed, classic touch when it comes to writing story so there isn't always much to spoil. But in my opinion, knowing everything right off the bat ruins the experience. So consider yourself warned. In 1986, Naotoshi Jean was involved in a serious motorcycle accident. As the days passed, bedridden, his mind drifted. Japan was then currently in a golden age of business, the bubble economy of the 80s, and he wanted to do something with the insurance money he had received from the accident. Thus, rising from tragic beginnings, From Software was born. But far from their future course, From Software was a company that specialized in business software, the company's biggest customer being the Japan Agricultural Cooperative Union, for whom it developed software to automate the rearing of livestock. As the years went by and the bubble popped, business orders started to come in slower. More and more, there were extended periods of free time at the office. One of the software engineers began making games to play on the company's PC-98 computer. And this man was Yasuyoshi Karasawa, a key figure in what would become the Armored Core franchise. From Software was a small office, with less than 20 employees, and quickly, Natoshi Jean caught wind of what Karasawa was up to. Interested in this idea of creating games, a small team began production on their first commercial product. And by small team, 
I mean a duo of programmers. Jean gave the team all the resources they required, as long as they operated independently and didn't affect the stability of the main business of the company. Several members of From Software, President Jean included, were fans of the Western dungeon crawler Wizardry for the Apple II. Because of this, despite the limitations of the PC-98, their project would have a few demands from the company president. He decided that the game, now dubbed Zam's K3, would be a dungeon crawler that featured a lot of robots, full 3D real-time rendering, and PvP, an optimistically advanced list of features for 1990. To meet these demands, the team needed fresh blood. So in 1993, later a leading member in the company's history, Shinichiro Nishida was recruited to handle the networking required for the PvP aspect of Zam's K3. The ambitious Zam's K3 would go on to be a mixture of complex dungeon crawling with high-paced mecha action, with dozens of character models on the screen at once, high-speed movement, and a battle system that included shooting, blocking, and melee combat. Quickly becoming too advanced to run on the PC-98, as well as becoming a sinkhole for company funds, President Jean made the difficult decision to shelve the project. But this would not last. Now Toshi Jean had not given up. In early 1994, Jean urgently called 10 of his employees back from their vacations and held an important meeting that would change the course of From Software forever. The topic of discussion, Sony's new up-and-coming console, the PlayStation. Since its October announcement, Jean had been researching the console's hardware. The PlayStation was powerful and prided itself on its 3D capabilities, while the development equipment was said to be cheap and the licensing fees low. Because of this, he proposed that From Software would develop a game to meet the PlayStation's December 3rd, 1994 release. Originally, the plan was to simply port over their work on Zam's K3, but while the storage capacity problems were solved by the use of the CD-ROM, the PlayStation couldn't run the game smoothly. The third-person mecha character model caused too much additional strain on the hardware, so once again, Zam's K3 was cancelled. Work began on a new game, with less than a year left to meet their December deadline. During this time, there was a heated debate on what viewpoint the new game should have. Some worried that the 3D first-person experience would create dizziness. Others argued that looking at the back of a character's head in third person was silly. There was even a proposal to use a combination of third person and fixed camera angles, like 1992's Alone in the Dark. Ultimately, they decided on something everyone at the company was passionate about, developing a fully 3D first-person RPG inspired by wizardry and Ultima. Because Zam's K3 was also a dungeon crawler, while they were out of luck with the science fiction elements, programmers were able to reuse the dungeon assets, allowing their earlier work, as well as the time and money spent, to be repurposed. A key element Naotoshi Jin was adamant about was the game being completely modeled in 3D, stating that with the completion of this game, they would be the world's first company to make a fully 3D first-person dungeon crawler. And there were earlier games like Ultima Underworld, which was a detailed first-person 3D experience, but like Doom, all of the items, enemies, and character models were 2D sprites. So, to my knowledge, From Software achieved their goal. It's no secret that 2009's Demon Souls was a spiritual successor to the oft-spoken and hushed whispers Kingsfield franchise. 
the grandfather of the so-called soul genre, Kingsfield has the awkward circumstance of being respected in name only. Few Western gamers gave the series a chance, and now, due to its age, it sits as a relic, a curiosity offered occasional glimpses in fuzzy screenshots, a footnote in the grand legacy of its lineage. Fewer still played the original Kingsfield, released exclusively in Japan on December 16th, 1994, for the Sony PlayStation. So starting from the very beginning, let's cast a light and dispel the mystery from this dear keystone of the past. Continuing where we left off, development began in March 1994 for a game then known as Crystal Dragon. With less than 10 months until release, time was short, so the team forewent making in-game tutorials. Jean disagreed with lecturing players on how to play the game, feeling that this unassisted start would create a feeling of loneliness. As fans of Western RPGs, the team drew from core elements of what they personally enjoyed. Complex mechanics, challenging difficulty, and a story that players piece together by exploring and talking with non-player characters, or NPCs. The lenient nature of Sony allowed a shift towards a darker fantasy world, something impossible with a family-friendly company like Nintendo. Jean felt that the atmosphere of the new game should be heavy brooding silence, expressing the feeling of being alone in a dark and cramped place, lonely and crying, scary to players, and that the difficulty should be harsh for beginners and mistakes swiftly punished. During production for Crystal Dragon, Shinichiro Nishida was assigned as a story writer, but due to the lack of manpower, he had to take on the additional roles of map designer and game tester. Influenced by his experience playing PC games like 1987's Dungeon Master and 1985's Fantasian, Nishida's vision, while not as bleak as Jean's, sought to capture the spirit of the 1980s RPGs warts and all. If you know anything about the old school RPGs, you will remember that this kind of world building was the mainstream in the RPGs of those days, right? So the enemies or traps or whatever are trying to be designed as the classic kind, so to speak. To reproduce the feeling of those old school games, my aim was to bring out the kind of fun I had when playing the Wizardry series on the PlayStation. At the time, Rum Software was an oddity in the industry. So when Sony sent a representative to take a look at their work, he was surprised by the very business-like office atmosphere. Due to the big government clientele they programmed for, the office was quiet and well-organized, and lacked any hint at being a game company, while the staff stood out from your usual game developer, as everyone was formal and wore suits. Though sometimes teased for making games in suits, this company's spirit would continue until 2001. Jean himself demonstrated their use of 3D polygons to render levels and items in what was referred to at the time as virtual reality. The issue was, many Sony employees, being new to the game industry after being shifted over from other internal departments, didn't understand what went into making a game, least of all a 3D game. Though advanced, they wondered if it would sell. Regardless, From Software was given a license and development equipment at the low cost of 2 million yen, about $16,300 today. At such a low price, even a small company like From Software could break into the industry. This strengthened Jean's resolve, though half of their 20 employees still focused on business programming, just in case things didn't pan out. Strangely, it was not until three months before release that From Software hired Aichi Hasegawa, the main programmer for the game. You see, the earlier demonstrations featured the finished levels and enemies, but lacked a way to interact with the game world, as there was no player character or combat system. During the final stage of development, From Software still hadn't received a PlayStation memory card from Sony, 
requiring game tester Nishida to test the game's balance, among other things, without dying. Finally, after frantically working overtime to meet the deadline, the ending CG and staff credits were completed only two hours before handing everything over to Sony. As this was From Software's first venture into a new industry, and most of their team was occupied with ensuring they had a finished product to begin with, there was no time, nor staff, dedicated to sales, market research, or PR. As such, they were forced to rely completely on Sony to promote their game, and after hearing word from Sony's purchasing department, the proposal for the initial release was the printing of 10,000 copies. This amount would have put From Software at a loss, not even covering the low cost of the development equipment. After negotiation, Sony raised the number to 13,000 copies, still putting From Software firmly in the red. The failure of this project would mean the end of From Software's time as a game developer. Thankfully, things worked out. Eight years after their founding as a business software company, and just 13 days after the release of Sony's first console, on December 16th, 1994, From Software released Kingsfield and officially took their first step towards the future. The story takes place in the small country of Verdite, a land surrounded by dense forests, encircled by fog. Long ago, a war ravaged the country, and a savior appeared that saved Verdite and its people. This savior was the Dragon of the Forest. Verdite honored the dragon by building a great sanctuary, and a legend was passed down that one day the Dragon of the Forest will return, bearing magical artifacts. Sometime later, but still very much in the distant past, a man, hungry for power, visited this sanctuary and returned with great magical abilities, taking over Verdite and becoming king. It was those of his lineage who started to build a royal cemetery on the sanctuary grounds. As the generations passed, the crypt bore deeper and deeper into the depths of the sanctuary. The kings were searching for something. You play as John Alfred Forrester, the eldest son of a woman of royal blood, and the famed commander of the royal guard, Hauser of House Forrester. Training in a neighboring country with a friend of his father's, John hears a rumor. The current king had probed too deep into the sacred grounds, and monsters arose, killing all who roamed the sanctuary turned crypt. The king ordered Commander Hauser to lead a large force and reclaim the royal tomb, but they were massacred and almost completely destroyed. So the king spread word across the lands, offering a bounty for the extermination of the monsters below. Concerned for his father, John returns to Verdite and enlists as a mercenary, going down into the tomb beneath the earth. What follows is a classic dungeon-crawling adventure, in the same vein as Wizardry in the equally popular Ultima series, specifically 1992's Ultima Underworld, The Stygian Abyss. Being one of the first games for the Sony PlayStation, as well as the first RPG on the system, frankly, I'm blown away by how well the game holds up today. Being completely honest, I expected Kingsfield to be pretty rough. I expected a somewhat derivative first attempt at game development, that suffered the same design pitfalls common for console adaptations of PC formulas. But to my surprise, Kingsfield sidestepped this, cutting out all of the bloated menus and dice-rolled chances to hit, delivering real-time, first-person fantasy exploration. Equally easy to pick up and put down, Kingsfield has a simple control scheme. The D-pad controls your character's movement, L1 and R1 strafe side to side, and L2 and R2 moves the camera up and down. Long before the dual analog controller, this strange camera setup gets the job done, though turning from side to side is painfully slow. This complete control of the camera 
created an immersion which, like Ultima before it, led to an experience dubbed as early virtual reality. No longer were you looking at a screen of flat, scrolling images. Now, players truly stepped into the role of the protagonist, seeing the adventure through their eyes in a three-dimensional world. Due to his aforementioned training, John can wield various weapons you come across, and with the blood of the Sorcerer Kings coursing through his veins, John has a budding magical potential, allowing new spells to be learned as you progress. Combat is not so much a dance as a high-risk game of chicken. Both the players and enemies bob and weave, like a duel between two swordsmen. Neither wants to leave an opening. Neither wants to strike first. A slow, methodical affair, combat requires players to dispose of their targets in a way that does not result in the trading of blows. There is no dodge or block button, so you kind of just have to move out of the way. Regrettably, this means that you are often just tanking damage during most of the final stretch, making things less a demonstration of skill than a show of how many items you have stacked up. The power and magic bars act as a stamina bar of sorts. Whenever you perform an attack, the bar empties, slowly filling back up. You must wait for it to fill completely to perform magic again. But physical attacks can be performed any time you have anything more than an empty bar, at the cost of reduced damage. Think of a full power bar as a fully powered attack. Different weapons specialize in one of three damage types, slash, chop, and stab with enemies having weaknesses to certain types of damage, though the difference is negligible. Killing enemies awards players gold and experience. As you level up and increase John's proficiency with both weapons and magic, your class will change. Classes are dictated according to your strength and magic stats, tied to which are new abilities that are unlocked at certain milestones later on. RPG fans will find more action than role-playing in this initial venture, as these classes are merely decorative. The only thing that changes according to the player is the strength and magic stats, which increase power in their respective areas, as well as the regeneration of their associated stamina bar, leading to an imbalance if players prioritize one over the other. There is an innate fear one feels from getting too close to a monster. The risk of damage, along with the first-person perspective, really lends the sense of danger involved. The camera itself has an unsettling feeling. Everything seems much too close, and your peripheral vision is non-existent, like you're viewing the world wearing blinders. The game's dungeon, a desecrated sanctuary that now doubles as the world tomb, though nothing special to look at, is oozing an atmosphere. Players are dropped into this dungeon, much like the protagonist John, hopelessly unprepared and unaware of what lies ahead. Armed with only a short sword and a limited use spell, you venture into the massive network of rooms and tunnels. Exploration is the name of the game, and until you find your first map, players must either rely on an eidetic memory or a pencil and paper. Every new room is a dangerous unknown that can mean a swift death. What traps or treasure lie within these walls? Should you retreat to safety or continue on? As a 3D console dungeon crawler, the game gets full marks. This is not a quick paced slaughter fest, but a game in which you slowly and safely kill your enemies and then spend a majority of your time searching for treasure and secret passages. Pulling out the old instruction manual, there is a treasure trove of useful information within, most interesting of which is the section where From Software themselves give the player advice for the journey ahead. I miss the time where developers could just drop all the pretenses and speak directly to players with these little booklets. Yeah, sometimes they could spice it up by writing everything as an in-universe guide or something. But this being From Software, and with how averse they are to tutorials or explanations. Well, seeing what they write when forced to make a tutorial is fascinating. You can get a small insight into how they expected the game to be played. Numerous times in the manual, it's mentioned that there's no shame in running from 
or past enemies. Even looting chests, and then dashing away to safety, is lauded as the player having found a way to survive. Nothing is unfair or cheating, as long as you survive and continue on. This may seem cryptic, and it is, but one line in the manual states, As your level increases, battle becomes more enjoyable, and eventually, you will be able to use techniques. A player may scratch his head after having read this, wondering, my level goes up, and my class sometimes changes. But what are these techniques? For that, we must wait until the end of the game. And even then, it's never taught to you. Players must discover the button inputs for the techniques on their own. Right away you can see from software getting their bearings. Grasping at a formula that would one day create demon souls and beyond. Shortcuts can be found that make the sprawling five-floor sanctuary seem smaller, more intimate. Floors loop back into each other, allowing almost instant access to anywhere you need to go. The NPCs are the same needy pessimists fans have come to know and love. Poor souls who, for various personal reasons, whether it be wealth, glory, or duty, have entered the sanctuary and, for the most part, have only found suffering and tragedy. Secret doors and illusory walls are everywhere, creating a compulsory need to mash your face against every surface, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But the real From Software touch lies in the delivery of the story. Besides the opening title crawl and the manual, the game is light on story. What little players can gather is gleams from the fragmented ramblings of the game's handful of NPCs. That, in the mirror. A must-have for any scholar is an item called the Mirror of Truth. Holding this mirror up to NPCs, enemies, or even a room itself will give the player a non-biased description of who or what you're looking at. The story is so fragmented, in fact, that if you miss one piece of dialogue from one specific character at the beginning, you'll be in the dark as to who the villain is until almost three quarters of the way through the game. Hope you paid attention. Today, From Software is known for its beautiful musical compositions, and Kingsfield, composed by Koji Endo and Kaoru Kono, is no different. Okay, high praise, perhaps, but the soundtrack is terrific for the time. Melting into the background, the music adds a nice ambiance as you explore. Despite the limitations of the era, Endo and Kono go over and above, exceeding what was typical of a soundtrack. A neat feature is the fact that there are two different tracks for the early floors, which switch when you reach a certain level in the game, giving a small, unnerving change to a conquered zone, as well as racking up the tension felt by the protagonist as the journey nears its end. There is even a unique shop theme, a warm inviting signal of safe haven, a feature which Kingsfield 2 and 3 rejected, and their shift to a somber, non-linear world. Special thanks to Yasushi Kawakami for the sound effects. On the whole, things are pretty normal, but the death scream lightened the mood, and made each death less annoying. And understandably, the noises the spiders and scorpions make were something of a joke in the Japanese fanbase back in the day. To the surprise of no one, none of the business programmers at From Software knew how to compose a soundtrack. So all of the sound design was contracted out to a company called Sound Kids, ran by Koji Endo, to which Kono and Kawakami belonged. The so-called graveyard is composed of five underground layers, each separated in a court rank. The deeper the level, the more important the figures buried therein. Why there is no place for prior kings is anyone's guess. Best not to analyze things too closely. For the most part, 
Each floor is a straightforward horizontal level. There is no confusing stairways or platforming, adding a third dimension to the map. No, each floor is entirely cut off and separated by warp sigils, so each stands alone, allowing players to systematically search an entire floor before moving on. Despite its label as a safe zone, and the hub for most of the game's NPCs, the first floor is the hardest floor in the game. You are a weak, wobbling child, a knave of the blade, and you will die time and time again, the only solace in your pain, the absurd screams of John as he dies. Your sword swings sluggishly. The enemy's hitboxes seem tiny and require getting uncomfortably close. Without a map, you are blind. Once you run out of MP, you are without magic. Healing items are scarce, and your gold reserves forever low. Kingsfield is a hard game because of this, but anyone that calls Kingsfield hard quit on the first level. One after the next, the items you find are nice quality of life additions, a map being the first major find. There's a fountain which restores your health and mana, a healing spell, a dragon staff which teleports you out of danger into the entrance of the current floor, better armor and weapons, keys that open locked doors and chests, and magic boots which let you cross small instant death pits, though not the poison or blade pits, because video games. These upgrades feel good to acquire. You explore and are rewarded. The game gets easier as it goes on. I would say that this has Metroidvania elements, but this predates Symphony of the Night by three years. It reminded me of the feeling I felt when I first played Zelda 1 and 2, or Simon's Quest. You get special items that allow new forward progress, but at the same time, it rewards players who backtrack access to early, inaccessible areas. But unlike Zelda, instead of a chest of rupees, Kingsfield cuts out the middleman and just gives you a piece of armor or a weapon. Death in Kingsfield means starting over from the very beginning. Crosses found throughout the sanctuary act as save points, allowing players to load at any time from the menu. It is a tad tedious that there's no option to load upon death, instead starting you over unprompted. But there is a reason for this later, I suppose. Players will quickly pick up on the nuance of combat after a death or ten, or at the very least, develop a nice instinct on what will affect their survival negatively. But what of the narrative? The opening blurb was interesting, and from software are renowned for their storytelling. So how does this first game fare? Well, in a makeshift chapel near your first save point, there is a priest named Judas Cross, who has had his cross stolen, and due to his situation, the gatekeeper felt bad and gave him a key which you need to unlock a third of the game's locks. Said gatekeeper also mentions giving a suspicious father and son a map. Yes, he calls them suspicious, and yet he gave them the only map of the sanctuary that the forces of good possess. Though he has a cool name, Ozzy Ronvalgve is terrible at his job. The NPCs you find may give vague clues to the game's story, but they're fairly direct in giving you clear goals to work towards. So right away, we have two objectives. First, find the priest's cross to receive the key, and find that map. The cross was stolen by one of the merchants, a thief named Gil Bacchus, who will sell it to you for the kingly sum of 1,800 gold, an exuberant amount for the early game. After returning Cross's cross, he mentions that for generations, the kings of Verdite have opposed the church due to their alleged demon blood. An intuitive player, if taking Cross at his word, can infer the link between this demon blood and the royal family's immense magical power. The other merchant is a man named Wilfred Wright. You can find a key called the Wright Family Key, which can open chests the affluent Wright family have hidden in the graves throughout the tomb. Next to Wilfred is one such locked chest. 
For the longest time, I hesitated to steal from the kindly old merchant. As Gil will tell you, Wilfred is blind, so he won't notice. I feared from software trickery, but after checking Wright's statement that Gil's shop is pretty expensive, and my shop isn't like that, I found that he was lying, and Gil, though out of the way and a thief, is the cheaper shop by nearly 10%. The chest didn't contain anything great, but I robbed that old con man all the same. Surprisingly, you face no retribution for doing so. That will change with time. Nearby Wilfred's shop is Bass Cries, a crestfallen knight who was tasked with staying behind to relay the situation below to the king. Cries waits at the barracks for the return of his commander and comrades. He knows that with the appearance of monsters on the first floor, they aren't coming back. Now he is merely waiting for the monsters to claim him, to give him the death he should have been given alongside his allies. According to him, the former King Reinhardt II has been brought back to life and is commanding the monsters. He pretty much tells you, you're going to die down here. And thankfully, John has a lifespan equal the player's willpower to continue playing, because nobody would survive with one life, first try. The last NPCs on the first floor are the suspicious father and son, Nicholas and Hans Orman. The two are a pair of grave robbers, and after an argument, Hans ran off with the map. You find him dead just a short distance away, and acquire your first map. The father continues digging, forever unaware of his son's fate. Once you acquire a map, things get slightly easier. No longer must you wander around. Now you can search and explore with purpose, knowing exactly where you have and haven't been. This simple map is invaluable, and will reveal almost all of the first three floors. The last piece that eases John's burden is finding and returning the dragon chalice to its rightful place. This allows the use of a fountain, which fully restores your HP and MP for free. Something I didn't realize until the end of the game, but from now on, whenever you die, for the cost of one dragon tree fruit, a rare consumable, you will respawn here at the fountain, retaining all of your items in progress. This is huge. Now there is no penalty for death, beyond trudging back to where you died from the first floor. Both of the game's shops are expensive early on, but a tip to the novice adventurer. Everything except the cross can be found hidden somewhere in the sanctuary ahead. So unless you really need something, or if you're a cheapskate like me, save your early gold for the cross and healing items. After that, spend at your leisure. Gold will become so abundant later that it's worthless. So buy whatever you want, as there's only two shops in the game. We are now entering spoiler territory. Think of everything before this as a primer, and what follows are advanced tactics and the story at large. Skip ahead if you wish to experience the thrills of Kingsfield firsthand. Sometime after the second floor, everything falls into place. After fighting your way through an entire floor of scorpions and man-eating plants, players become accustomed to various ways of exploiting the combat system. When you hit enemies, they flinch. Simple to see, sure. But if you perfectly time your strike, you can counter enemies and cancel their attacks before they hit you. Circle strafing is good. Forward and back is okay when in tight spaces. But this parrying works any time and anywhere, and makes you feel like a god. The second floor itself is teeming with monsters. Fire-breathing lizardmen roam the treasury with poison-coated blades. Ghosts of nobles haunt a trap-filled graveyard, and powerful golems patrol in her rooms, daring you to steal their treasure. To put it simply, the second floor is deadly, and one must tread carefully. This is the final challenge before you become so powerful that you will coast through the rest of the game. The golems do have a great death animation, 
You'll see it a lot, but you never get tired of it. John runs into a lone knight, Eric Blair. A man the crestfallen cries, warned of as a coward and a thief, who joined Commander Hauser, only to desert the group and loot the tomb of its treasures. What's cool about Eric is that players will spot him on different floors as they progress. Often found skulking around safe areas, he offers invaluable advice and hints, such as the fact that invisible bridges can be seen if shot with magic. Farther in, you meet a large fairy, who cryptically tells John, I have waited for you, and deep in the darkness, the king's power grows. Our strength will not hold for long. Find us as soon as possible. And then she disappears, or rotates through the ceiling. Imagine missing that one line at the start. You wouldn't have a clue what she was talking about. <laughs> yeah, imagine. Careful adventurers who use the truth mirror learn that her name is Miria, and that she is a faithful servant of the Dragon of the Forest. Hiding away in a cave is the sage Rally Kelvim, a white wizard said to equal the white magician Michael Zeus of legend, a character that is never referenced again. It's up to you to carry the memory of his name. Kelvim confidently states that the artifacts of legend are mere trinkets to him, declaring that his search is for truth, as all things are powerless before truth, even magic. In exchange for your truth mirror, the sage teaches a powerful healing spell, leaving you without the extra flavor text, but making the game that much easier. A tough yet fair trade, but don't worry, there's another mirror hidden away somewhere else. Before moving on to floor three, you find a wandering minstrel named Heinz Ruhart, who was sent down here, a non-combatant, by the king to write an epic poem of the battle. He has suffered serious physical and mental trauma, and is now lost in a cave filled with monsters, rendered blind by the horrific sights he has witnessed. Hoping to heal his sight, he trades his magic harp for a dragon tree fruit, the respawn item that also fully restores HP and MP. And this harp allows John to raise platforms to progress onward, and unfortunately, is never used again outside of this floor. Sadly, the need for the parry technique is also short-lived. If you aren't overly reliant on magic, you don't have to be as cautious, while well, with the healing spell. And upon entering the third floor, you quickly find a sword that slowly regens both health and magic, while also boasting incredible damage, effectively breaking the game and making floors three through five a cakewalk compared to the first two. A favorite combo of mine is stunning an enemy with magic and following through with a sword strike, a patented one-two that will mindlessly carry you through to the credits. On floor three, you meet the rather corporal ghost of Randolph VIII, the king before last. Just to keep things straight, we're juggling three separate kings, the current king, the former king, and the king before last. Randolph was a just king, who was as loved by his subjects as he was powerful, feared by his younger brother, the former King Reinhardt II, and his nephew, the current King Reinhardt III, he was poisoned. King Randolph is outraged at his brother's current actions, and teaches John fire magic, telling him to seek his legendary armor and sword, which are imbued with his signature fire element. You could just buy this armor at Gil's shop, but while the king's armor isn't one of a kind, it is free, so it's worth tracking down. Randolph warns John of the powerful servants of his brother waiting below, King Reinhardt's right-hand man, the Dark Magician, and his trusted swordmaster, the Black Knight, the latter of which is rumored to match Commander Hauser in ability and hopelessly outclasses John. Floor 4 is an annoying change of pace due to your map having outlived its use. You are once again wandering blind, hampered by the fact that the entire floor is a maze designed to trick you with its similar web-like passageways. After navigating the dense maze, you find a dying Watts Virgil, the aide and bodyguard of John's father. With his last breath, he tells you he witnessed Commander Hauser perish, defeating the Black Knight, the Champion of Darkness. 
Nearby, John finds his father's grave. It seems that after his astonishing victory against the Black Knight, the Dark Magician was so impressed by Hauser's skill that he gave him an honorable burial. The grave is surrounded by healing herbs and covered by the family sword, an immovable chunk of stone that only comes free at John's touch. On the way to the fifth floor, you have an anticlimactic boss battle with the Dark Magician's ghost, who is nothing against the might of the overpowered one too. The fifth floor is swarming with powerful foes. It is here where you'll find a dragon door like the other three, hidden throughout the game. I sure hope players aren't conditioned to ignore these doors at this point, as unlike the others, this one is unlocked. Inside waits the fairy Myria and the rather shabby looking dragon of the forest. It turns out that the dragon of the forest gifted the stone sword to the Forester family ages ago, hence their name and using the last of Myria in its power, they return light to the sword and turn it into the Sword of Moonlight, the first iteration of a long-running From Software tradition. This weapon, true to its reputation, is the strongest in the game. And much like the Triple Fang, it regens HP and MP, but it also secretly holds a well-known power. A hidden feature in Kingsfield is that four weapons have techniques or magical abilities that are locked behind stat requirements. This is achieved by attempting to perform a spell in the middle of an attack, with one of the four specific weapons. The timing is precise, but easily executed. To perform these powerful abilities, the Rapier Kalishmard and the King's Flame Sword require 40 strength and magic, while the Triple Fang and Moonlight Sword require max stats of 80. Before fighting the final boss, backtracking is required to open the other, now unlocked, dragon doors, and gather the enchanted forest armor and shield. While we're backtracking, there's a chest that you can find out in the open at the beginning of the game. Well, now that it's the end of the game, it can finally stop taunting you. Inside is a verdite gem, an item which raises your magic stat, helping players get that much closer to realizing the Moonlight Sword's true power. Many of the other locked chests you couldn't get to contain these gems. And now the final boss. Well, where is he? Believe it or not, but he's hidden behind an illusory wall. I know, how evil. Near the dragon door where you get the Moonlight Sword, there is such a wall. Behind this wall is a large room with a great black void. Following the flames and crossing the invisible bridge, you are led to a room with five dragon tree fruits and a few powerful enemies. Another dead end. Walking back across the invisible bridge, there's another path. Take a leap of faith and drop to another invisible platform and continue ahead. From here, you are warped to a room filled with giant enemies. Choose the correct warp pad and enter the final room. A wrong choice here warps you back to the start of Floor 5. This entire section is... beyond words. The sheer thought that the ending is hidden behind not only an illusory wall, but an invisible bridge that requires jumping off halfway onto another invisible walkway is... well, it's classic role-playing game nonsense. Gygax would be proud. Inside, you come face to face with Reinhardt II, the poisoner of his brother, King Randolph VIII. But he's a statue. Then who's the final boss? More than any other king, the current king, King Reinhardt III, had an obsession with the artifacts of legend. It would seem that in his lust for magical artifacts, he would often go down into the tomb alone, searching for that which the dragon gifted the ancients of Verdite. Some time ago, he resurrected his father and summoned the demonic hordes of monsters found deep underground. A small hint is given to players 
in an easily missable conversation, where Eric mentions having seen the king pass him by on floor three, wondering if he was seeing things. Again, there's not much context for which king he's talking about, as King Randolph is also on that floor, so it's only clear in hindsight. In dabbling with dark magics beyond his ken, the king was transformed into the fleshy masked core of this dungeon. After calmly introducing himself as your king, Reinhardt III alludes to your expected fight with his father and implies that you just missed him. He has quelled the threat and turned him to stone. All is well. He then expresses his surprise that the unimpressive Forrester family sword is the artifact his family has long searched for. The king demands the heirloom, and the final fight begins. He can only be defeated by magic, due to a pit in between the two of you. So I hope you leveled your magic, or this is going to be a long fight. Using the powerful lightning magic of the Moonlight Sword, he is swiftly defeated, and the kingdom is saved. Roll credits. The epilogue states that John, achieving his goal of surpassing his father's swordsmanship, overcomes his sorrow and journeys out into the world to see what his future holds. But as long as the blood of demons courses through the kings of Verdite, then some day another may open the door to darkness again. And that's it. No storybook ending. No sparkling ribbon tied off all neat. True to the classic fantasy stories of the past, time moves on. The story continues in the minds of the players. Speaking of the credits, it's hard to believe how old this game is. I've played many PlayStation games that looked worse, but this game is from such an early Wild West age of the PlayStation that when you quit, it basically locks up like an old PC game and tells you to remove the CD and turn off power. I'd never seen that before. I also became quite intimate with the ending theme, due to the fact that after the credits end, it doesn't take you back to the main menu, as there isn't one, but instead starts a new theme, which loops repeatedly until you shut down the console. I really enjoyed this song. My thanks to the composers. And now for the first in the Sword of Moonlight roundup. Check. Having a major presence in the narrative, it's kind of hard to miss. Upon release, Japanese reception of the game was divided. First-person RPGs were unfamiliar to Japan, having only accepted the RPG genre not even a decade before. Sure, it was fans of Wizardry and Ultima that created franchises such as Dragon's Quest and Final Fantasy, but these Western games were still niche to the general Japanese market. As a result, this foreign perspective laden with the brutal difficulty curve, pushed many away. I imagine there were more than a few children who spent their New Year's money on this and felt they got robbed. Kingsfield was received poorly by gaming magazines, most stating that it was too hard to play. Many gave it their lowest rating. The game's name was also viewed as lame. Why Kingsfield? The setting is an underground crypt. Well, it turns out that it was named after a golf course one of the developers visited in England. A golf course I have had no luck in tracking down. If anyone knows of a golf course fitting this description circa 1994, leave a comment below. Though ill-fitting to the setting, I will agree that the name definitely carries the aspect of a great fantasy title. It was only through an online internet forum that Kingsfield gathered fans. Like Tokimeki Memorial before it, only on a much smaller scale, word spread over the internet in a community formed to discuss the game and its secrets. Complaints of difficulty turned into praise. The feeling of growth and overcoming the game's challenging nature was referred to as addictive. From Software had found their player base. Five months after release, an affirmative 30 out of 40 from Famitsu brought Kingsfield to a larger audience. The game was a success, selling over 200,000 copies. Due to being an early PlayStation title by a fledgling developer, and with the West not getting the PlayStation until September 1995, 
Kingsfield 1 never made its way to Western Shores. Uh, hands off the keyboard. Trust me on this. Your confusion will be addressed in Kingsfield 2. All in all, I had a pretty good time with this one. Kingsfield is hard yet fair. It may at times be too generous with its treasure, but this power is the reward for thorough exploration. Kingsfield gives off a poor first impression, but if given a chance, it delivers an enjoyable dungeon-crawling experience. If you come into this expecting the exciting boss fights from software is known for, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. We're not there just yet. Two bosses, and neither offer much of a challenge. It's hard to recommend Kingsfield due to its age and availability, but I consider it a hidden gem that I'm happy to finally gotten around to playing. Short, sweet, and to the point, Kingsfield doesn't overstay its welcome or become stale, clocking in at a little under eight hours for a first-timer. A surprisingly solid title for the first game in a legacy. Confident of the imminent success of Kingsfield, From Software immediately got to work on the follow-up. Due to the close proximity of the release, most of the original team stayed on. No real mix-up just yet. Now Toshi Jin headed the project, while Sound Kids returned as composers. As a result of this lightning-fast turnaround, when popularity surged for the original Kingsfield after the May Famitsu review, from Software was ready with the sequel, and on July 21st, 1995, Kingsfield 2 was released. This time, both North America and Europe received English localizations, and since Kingsfield 2 had already been out for two months by the time the PlayStation released, the English publisher ASCII, in a Final Fantasy number situation, decided to skip the first game and retitled 2 as simply Kingsfield, hence the confusion. And it also explains why there's no Kingsfield 3 in the West. Hidden away in the forests of Verdite lies a monument inscribed with writing so ancient only descendants of the High Elves could decipher it. This was written. A ship covered in blue light came down from the heavens and struck the island of Melanot, penetrating deep within the island. Those who came from faraway lands, in search of the island's treasures, never returned alive. Never approach the island, for a sleeping beast in the darkness awaits the Great Awakening. And with that, you wake up on a beach, the wreckage of a ship drifting to shore beside you. Wait a minute. Okay, there's more in the manual. A whole book's worth of new lore, in fact. Hope you have the manual, or you will be hopelessly lost. Also, for players who hadn't bought the first game, or those in the West, there's a handy synopsis. Let's take a look. A young warrior named... Alfred? Hmm, okay. I guess John started going by his middle name. Returned from the island of... Melanot. Huh? They retconned the sanctuary to being on Melanot. Adventure, monsters, slaying the former king who was actually... The black dragon god Gyra. What? It turns out that the English manual was created whole cloth by the ASCII translators. I know they didn't anticipate lore purists nitpicking over what was common for localizations at the time, but this is egregious. I already spent hours attempting to piece this confusing narrative together and writing it all out, and then I discovered this when I decided to compare the manuals. No dialogue in the English release can be trusted now. Ignoring that, while I don't know Japanese, as best as I can work out, the Japanese manual states, By the time Jean returned from the sanctuary, six months had gone by. Jean is now Jean, as I suppose changing it to French made it sound fancier. As the only survivor that had gone below, everyone at the castle was curious as to what had happened. Rest in peace, NPCs. 
telling his account of the events, his father's death, the moonlight sword, and the king turning into a demonic creature. The people praised the young man as a hero. This was the beginning of the story of King Alfred of Verdite. Along with the Holy Sword, King Alfred became a shining beacon for the country, and with his just rule, peace returned. Alfred went on to marry, his wife blessing him with two children. The small country of Verdite is surrounded by forests on all sides, and is one of the three northern countries on the continent. In the depths of the western forest, there is the country of Egret, and through the southern forest, Granatki. Past the northern forest was the vast calming waves of the Verd Sea. Beyond, the cursed island of Melanot, a land of eternal night. The time will soon come when this peace will crumble, the king replied calmly one day to his wife. For a long time, King Alfred gazed into the distance from the castle window staring into the forest to the east, as if to anticipate the tragedy that was to come. It will continue, he whispered. It all started when a hunter from the village of Nuez, on the border of Granatki and Verdite, went to the forest to hunt. Two weeks later, he had still not returned. A search party was dispatched, and after five days, they too were declared missing. On the morning of the sixth day, a member returned. There were demonic creatures in the forest. Everyone else was killed. Panic swept the kingdom. Once again, darkness was ready to envelop the land. The king journeyed countless times to pacify his people and fight back the monsters. But a greater problem emerged. The Sword of Moonlight, the symbol of Alfred's rule and the hope of Verdite, was stolen. Perhaps because of the traces of his mother's royal blood, the king's intuition was unusually sharp. Sending men to the island of Melanot to find the truth behind the sword's disappearance, time passed, and no word came from the island. Alfred was uneasy. There was a greater power at work. At the same time, Alfred's old friend, Aleph Garusha Regnes, was visiting the castle. Loved like a younger brother, Aleph was the second prince of Granatki, and was formally trained under Commander Hauser, Alfred's father. Hearing the story of the appearance of monsters and the robbery of the Holy Sword, Aleph remembered the legends of the elves and the tales of the mysterious cursed island. Enticed by Alfred's words of a slumbering beast who long ago fell upon the island, Aleph offers the journey to Melanot himself. Alfred refused on account of the death that awaited his friend. But Aleph's stubborn nature and strong will convinced the king. And so Aleph set sail for Melanot. But in the dead of night, out of the cursed bird sea, there came a horde of monsters, and the vessel was lost. No one survived save Aleph, who washed up on shore. Everything he packed for his quest sat at the bottom of the sea. So pulling a dagger from his boot, Aleph walked down the dark beach, determined to uncover what lurks beneath the island, and to find his friend's holy sword. Like I said, it's a lot of information to miss just by not reading the manual. In this case, the Japanese manual. Surprisingly, despite the close proximity of the releases, Kingsfield 2, while similar in terms of gameplay to its predecessor, has a bevy of updates. Acknowledging the slow movement in the first game, From Software added the ability to sprint, which can be held indefinitely, but drains the stamina bars to zero, requiring time to allow it to regenerate for the player to attack. So if you impatiently run everywhere, you are punished with having to wait to defend yourself. Hmm, there's a lesson in there somewhere. When it comes to combat, same strategy as always. Stay light on your toes. Strafe and do whatever you need to do to not get hit. The enemies have gotten a tad smarter. Circle strafing will work most of the time, but don't rely on it. And there is a huge selection of weapons and spells this time around, so players can tailor their loadout to their tastes as they progress, adapting as the situation calls for it. Instead of randomly learning new spells like Jean, 
Aleph starts with no magic, and must find elemental crystals to farther his abilities. Each element has four spells, with each crystal teaching you the next tier spell of said element. So your first fire crystal will teach you fireball, while the second will teach you fire wall, and so on. If you were to say, miss the first three wind crystals, and find the final one late game, the first spell you learn will always be wind cutter. The final spell in each category cannot be learned without first collecting all four crystals. It's a neat little mechanic, a welcome upgrade to the uncertainty of the first game. The class system is gone, but remember the secret magic weapon abilities from the first game? Well, those are back, and this time, you only need to grind your stats to 60. Imagine someone wasting their time grinding to 80 because they didn't sift through ancient game FAQs to find the one guy that wrote a guide that actually knew what he was talking about. Crazy, right? <laughs> and now for the moment you have all been waiting for. Bows and crossbows have been added. Yes, everyone's favorite suboptimal garbage weapon makes its first appearance. In classic From Software style, the damage isn't great, the ammunition is severely limited, and in the crossbow's case, your bolts are completely non-renewable. I might add that the two identical crossbows are hidden in a secret wall panel, so as always, keep an eye out. Though a neat addition, the bows aren't much more than a gimmick, effective in only very specific instances, primarily an early boss fight. If you want to try a bow build, and I say build very loosely. Knock yourself out. Just be prepared to run out of arrows fighting normal mobs. Aside from the ability to run, Kingsfield 2 showers us with three additional, much needed mechanics. Throughout your searching, players can find three sets of warp gates with matching keys, moon, sun, and star. These keys can be slotted into pedestals next to save points, and with the use of a gate, can warp you to the save point for the cost of 10 MP. Tactful placement can allow players to warp to key areas at a moment's notice, allowing you to quickly stock up and head out, as well as cutting down on backtracking the areas you plan to revisit. It's up to you, really. With three keys, there are all manner of setups that can make trekking across the large island less time-consuming than it need be. A major issue in Kingsfield 2 is the fact that many areas are designed to trap you, forcing you to warp out with this newfound ability. But since using a gate requires 10 MP, or God forbid, you haven't found or placed a key somewhere, well, then you're effectively softlocked. Not by accident, but by design. I see the developer's reasoning, but purposefully softlocking a player is cruel and unusual. So always, always, Reserve some MP for warping, and if you can't warp, do not drop anywhere that looks suspect. This has been your public service announcement. It's cute how they warn you in the manual to be careful until you get a gate and key set. They don't warn you of the agonizing danger, just be careful. The Dragon Fountain makes a return, but new and improved. With the use of two Dragon Talismans, Players can upgrade the fountain, unlocking four different waters. Yeah, that's right. My new dragon god lets me have four different waters. Blue heals you. The questionable red, uh, water, restores your mana. The useless green water cures you of status ailments. And the most powerful of all, when all three streams meet at the fountain, they combine to form yellow water. There are an infinite number of yellow water jokes one can make, so I'll leave it to your imagination. This gold water is the nectar of the gods, allowing one to possess the power of all three waters simultaneously. A wonder water, a panacea, and with the addition of flasks, a souped-up forefather of Estes. Now I'm sure more than a few eyes lit up at the mention of flasks. Yes, I'm glad to inform you that Kingsfield too as renewable healing for the on-the-go adventurer, courtesy of the god of the fountain, the white dragon Seath. Flasks can be found as well as created by giving an NPC rare crystals found around the island. Remember how I mentioned that arrows are limited? 
Well, would you rather trade two crystals for a permanent refillable flask? Or trade one crystal for ten arrows? Hmm, yeah, the choice is simple. I must say that the act of manually refilling the flasks at the fountain is satisfying in a manner almost cathartic. All of the stress and pain of exploring washes off you in that instant. It's just you and enough bottles of yellow liquid to drown a bull moose. Seriously, by the end I had fifteen flasks. More than enough to brute force anything you come across. The final addition is the ability to hotkey any one item at a time the player chooses. Being able to walk around and chug a flask at the press of the select button, no longer must you navigate menus to heal during battle. The future is now. And there are two more superfluous features. Players can find two crystal statues of Seath hidden on the island. After completing a side quest, a villager gifts players a jeweled necklace that when worn, allows the statues to act as a sacrificial totem upon death, breaking the statue but reviving Aleph at the fountain free of charge. These statues are infinitely renewable, as upon destruction, they respawn where you first pick them up. A useful mechanic for those who require it, but the hassle of backtracking to get the statues, and the necklace wasting a precious accessory slot, make this, in my opinion, suboptimal. I actually completely missed the second thing, only learning of it in my extended online research. Scattered around the island are these trees. Occasionally they may hold a dragon tree fruit, implying that these are the dragon trees themselves, but often they're barren. Well, if you really need it, you can use these trees to grow more fruit, giving players a larger inventory of the healing and respawn item. But since you get so many across normal play, I don't think this is necessary unless you're having trouble, especially considering the out-of-the-way areas these trees are located. Kingsfield 1 took place in a cramped bipolar dungeon. To top it off, if you recall, those five floors were separated by war pads. Kingsfield 2 gives you the entire island of Melanot to explore, this time with the addition of stairs and slopes to add a little touch of 3D to spice up the level design. Sadly, because of the free reign you're given of the sprawling island, there isn't much in the way of shortcuts. A lot of areas are fairly linear, and while there's a remedy for this, backtracking is unavoidable without significant planning. Being a modern man, spoiled by modern conveniences, I didn't notice until hours into the game but there are no loading screens in this game. No, I can't express how incredible this truly is. In this 1995 PlayStation 1 game, there are no loading screens. Why wasn't this in the reviews? This is groundbreaking. The only loading screens in the game are hidden behind these large doors, which separate certain areas. But there's probably only two or three in total. Kingsfield 2 makes use of these doors, exactly like Mass Effect did its infamous elevators, but in 1995. Remarkable. Anyway, back to the action. Be ever vigilant, as death lurks around every corner. Traps are everywhere. But so are hidden valuables. I know this will get me stabbed around these parts, but I've never completed a 3D Zelda game. In making the jump to 3D, I can't help but feel something was lost along the way. It's difficult to explain without having to break everything down, and we don't have the time for it here. But honestly, even more than the first game, Kingsfield 2 feels truer to the feeling I felt playing the original Zelda. Just getting dumped into a mysterious location, filled with dangerous monsters, having to rely on your quick reflexes and wits to stay alive, all while possibly walking past a secret wall containing a special item that, while important, isn't presented on a platter. That is my bread and butter. Exploring the island and uncovering its secrets is the high point of the game for me. So perhaps what I liked about the original Zelda's and Simon's Quest was the obtuse puzzle-like progression, partnered with the brutal difficulty, culminating in a satisfying feeling of triumph over having overcame a difficult challenge.
Well, as we will see, this is one of From Software's main offerings. So, that explains why I'm a fan. As with the first game, Kingsfield excels in the thrill of exploration. Secret passages and treasure are what pushes the player to explore dark corridors and treacherous caves, not the monsters. Combat is the method to remove these obstacles. It in itself doesn't have the depth required to rise above the feeling of discovery. Those obsessed with fighting monsters will quickly tire of it if they aren't invested in the mystery of the island, as once your back is turned, same as the original. Enemies often respawn rather quickly upon leaving a room, leaving the adventurer with one clear goal. Kill the monsters, search thoroughly for treasure, and swiftly retreat before wasting any more resources. The more you backtrack needlessly, the more you fight the same resurrected foes. Plan accordingly. And I hope you're keen on exploration, because players will be doing a lot of it. It is very easy to get lost in the enormous island complex, and don't expect much help from the NPCs. They may offer hints towards certain areas or secrets, but when it comes to forward progression, you're on your own. Really, up until the end of the game, you can't tell exactly where you are in the story, as you kind of just wander from area to area, picking stuff up. Nothing you do feels like it's getting you closer to finding the Sword of Moonlight, as searching pirate caves, mines, or a castle ruin gets you no closer to finding who stole the sword. Aleph and the player both know that the guy ruling over the island probably has the sword, but in the meantime, there isn't any problem with stealing everything that isn't nailed down, right? I mean, this is a cursed island, filled with treasure. Princes need a little excitement in their lives, too. For those who wished for more boss fights, then I have good news. Your prayers have been answered, in the most sadistic way imaginable. When you begin your adventure on the dark beach, you have the world at your feet. You can go wherever you want. To the south is a gruff fisherman, a path to a magical lighthouse, and a spattering of tunnels. Or you could go north and meet the Kraken, the first boss. Players have a 50-50 shot, left or right, and one option, only a few second jaunt, leads straight into the maw of a boss that will brutally end you and restart your game. I, of course, being stubborn to a fault, threw myself at the Kraken until I could beat him. The intelligent player can just come back later. After all, for my trouble to get into the cave the Kraken was guarding, I was instantly killed by little squids that were stronger than the boss himself. Go figure. The save point isn't handed to you this time around. It took me nearly 90 minutes and 15 restarts before I found the first save. I'm sure many gave up a lot sooner. A running theme we will see in these games is that getting through the beginning is usually the first major hurdle. The starting enemies here immediately strike fear into the player. The little squids are much more difficult than any early foe from game one, requiring multiple strikes to destroy their defensive headpiece before allowing you to damage the main body. And there are other quote-unquote normal monsters you will face, like the fish who jump out of the water, who will one-shot you making the life of a new player pure hell. After a while, you'll have to keep track of where you find what, as each death will completely start you over, forcing players to once again make the dash through the area to pick up the discovered gear. Reasonably, this gets old rather quickly, and doesn't give Kingsfield 2 a good first impression. Once you have some gear, and finally find a save point, things become a bit more manageable. But until then, for a first-timer and veteran alike, slow and steady wins the race. The death traps and monsters will wait for you. Best to err on the side of caution. Hard to get anywhere when you're standing still. Scattered around the island complex, rhombus keys can be found to open locked doors. The catch, both sides of the door require a key to be slotted into the plaque to open. This mechanic allows players to either leave the keys for quick access later, or they can pocket the rhombus on their current side to use on another door. 
but with the teleport function, there is a chance that players could potentially softlock themselves with poor ROM displacement and warp key positioning. Something to keep in mind. The less I say about the soundtrack is probably for the best, as I'm no expert. Sadly, unlike the first title, where Indo and Kono went above and beyond with the changing tracks for levels. This just feels average. It's more of the same, and feels like it was the bare minimum expected. So no neat little experimental BGMs this time. There's nothing that jumps out at you as immediately memorable. The music melts into the background, and you forget it's there most of the time. It's just a serviceable soundtrack that does its job and no more. Not bad, but not great. Over the course of our journey, Prince Aleph slays a kraken, rescues a child from a nest of giant termites, duels magic armor in an enchanted castle, and braves an ice cavern filled with frost elementals. Compared to Kingsfield 1, the sequel really pulls out all the stops. The Mirror of Truth returns, but now we also have item descriptions. But you can't just read these descriptions in a menu. No, that would be boring. To access these descriptions, you need to track down a fortune teller named Meryl, who travels between a handful of specific locations. It makes sense from a storytelling perspective that Aleph wouldn't just know the history of any item he picks up. But finding Meryl whenever you want to read something can be a pain. To properly understand the story, we must first understand the history of Melanot itself. This is the best I could work out the original lore, despite ASCII's meddling. After witnessing the blue ship crash land on the island, the ancient elves went to investigate. Finding the land covered with precious glittering crystals, they built a holy shrine on the island to honor their light god. After the shrine was erected, monsters arose and slaughtered the elves. Those who survived later died from a mysterious poison. But the white dragon god Seath saved his followers by giving them sacred water to purify the poison. Many centuries later, a king named Harvine III, known as the King of the Winds because of his use of powerful wind magic, unified the continent and traveled to the cursed island to construct a castle from which he would rule his new kingdom. Followed by three companions, the wizard Crimson Zedek, the fortune teller Meryl, and the foreign ronin, Shinjuro Nishizato. King Harvine struggled against the uncontrollable nature of the island for a time. The fire mage Zedek attempted a coup but was swiftly imprisoned by his master. But in the chaos, monsters once again arose, and they and the mysterious poison killed all who remained on the island. As a result, Harvine's kingdom fractured and a great war ravaged the lands, dividing the continent into the three countries. Legions of monsters crossed the sea, and Egret and Granatki were completely destroyed and left in ruins. This segues into the legend from the first game, where the people of Verdite awaited their inevitable destruction, when suddenly, the dragon of the forest appeared and saved the country. In a semi-retcon to the first game, the Dragon of the Forest wasn't a literal dragon, but a title given to the hero who saved Verdite. Now you would think that this hero would be an ancestor of the Forester family, as they received the Moonlight Sword from the being formerly known as the Dragon of the Forest. But no, legends seem to point to the real hero being the legendary High Elf, Meryl Ol, who was the champion of Seath and wielding a magic sword named after his god, beat back the darkness covering the land. But just as the High Elves worshipped the light, there were elves who allied themselves with darkness, the black dragon god Gyra. These elves became known as the Dark Elves, who I might add looked the same as regular elves. Somewhere on the island, the Dark Elves built a temple of their own, a grand coliseum, where the champion of Gyra was chosen. These two dragon gods had waged wars using their followers since the dawn of time. This confrontation on the island was no different. 
The two champions faced each other, Meryl Ol, the champion of Seath, and the champion of Gyra, Gallus V, a dark elf warrior commonly referred to as a demon. Darkness triumphed over light, and Meryl Ol was slain. Now, the timeline here seems off. The tales of the High Elves seem ancient, and their ruins are buried and hidden deep beneath the island. Likewise, their treasures are deeply desired by the current followers of darkness. But if Meryl Ol was the dragon of the forest, then he saved the country after Harvine III failed to conquer Melanet, during an era where the High Elves were all but legend. It doesn't help that Gallus V was defeated and lost his position as champion to an earth mage named Shadam Lymph, an associate of Zedex. So there's no way the elves could have hidden during the entire Harvine situation, resurfaced after his fall to save Verdite, then gotten wiped out after the duel with Gallus V, if V died during the Harvine era. No, something is wrong. Someone is lying. The only odd piece in this story, the proclamation that Meryl Ol was the savior of Verdite. The followers of Seath made an attempt to alter history, but why? Moving on, somewhere in between then and now, a band of pirates led by a man named Old Hand ravaged the seas, using Melanot as their hideout. But the greed and poison of the island soon overtook the weak-hearted pirates. Their skeletons now roam the coast, protecting their treasure. Over the centuries, there have been numerous champions of Gyra's dark arena. The dark elf Gallus V, Earth Mage Shot on Lint, and Kel Fergus, the Ice Warrior. But the current title holder and ruler of Melanot, as well as the thief of the Sword of Moonlight, is the Pope. Yes, the Pope. The English translation, understandably, changed his name to Necron, as they also changed the pirates to Vikings for some reason. But yeah, the main villain's the Pope. Actually, the soldiers you see around the island are warrior monks that the Pope is puppeting. Unable to control their bodies, they fight. Unable to feel pain. Better to slay them and end their suffering. That's basically the abridged version of what's going on. There's a lot more lore that doesn't directly impact the plot, so there's more to be found if this all sounds interesting to you. This bit is only scratching the surface. The NPCs you meet on the island are either a collection of treasure seekers looking to make a fortune mining the island's crystals, or descendants of the original elves that worshipped both Seath and Gyra. Due to the island's poison, all who come to the island are trapped, needing the purifying waters of Seath's fountain to survive. The Pope has taken advantage of this, and subjects the villagers to his will by controlling access to the fountain. Swooping in to exploit the situation for profit, a pair of Dark Elf merchants bleed the village of resources in return for food. Sadly, the villagers are so reliant on them, that they have convinced themselves that these vultures are good Dark Elves. NPCs have been overhauled, with numerous quest lines and personal drama to follow. There's death, betrayal, and twists. Everything one looks for in a From Software side quest. A neat little Easter egg, but hidden away on a lone island, is the grave of the Eastern Swordsman, Shinjuro Nishizato an old-timey version of Shinichiro Nishida's name. This grave awards players with a magic katana and marks the first in a long tradition of East and West coming together. Now we enter the realm of spoilers. Leave now, or forever be spoiled on a nearly 30-year-old game. Just as Aleph arrives at the Colosseum to challenge the Pope, things take a startling turn. Down a narrow stairway beneath the arena, 
is a laboratory. The last thing anyone expects from a warrior pope that hangs out in an arena all day. The least of our worries are the vats growing demons, for in a back room there are more vats. But these vats contain fairies. No, they contain a fairy, Miria, the faithful servant of the dragon of the forest. You know this because the fairies endlessly repeat her lines from within their tubes. So what does this all mean? Well, for one, it means that the demons are created from science, not a hell portal. As for Myria and the dragon, well, if Myria is a test tube fairy created by Gyra, well, I don't have much hope for that lame paper mache parade float. After a boss rush, Aleph finally gets to fight the Pope, who looks nothing like what you expected, does he? The fight is easily the best boss in the game. He has a wide assortment of spells to throw at you, but what you really need to watch out for is his fists. Though a powerful spellcaster, the Pope was one of the many characters who trained with Commander Hauser back in the day, so he enjoys running up and comboing you to death, which you can't really get mad about, as it looks cool. That is, until you realize that you have to run the boss gauntlet every time you challenge him. Upon his defeat, you come up empty-handed. He didn't have the sword. Backtracking a bit, you can retrieve the armor of Seath to go with Meryl Ol's legendary sword you found earlier. Then you can throw that sword out when your NPC buddy Leon pulls through and makes you the best sword in the game. Though I haven't mentioned him yet, the craftsman Leon Shore is an important figure in the world of Kingsfield, though he often just stands around a lot. Originally hailing from Verdite, Leon was persecuted for being born from the union of a human father and a high elf mother. So this mother brought him to Melanot. I don't really understand why, but let's just chalk it up to her being a Verdite elf and not knowing just how accurate the legends surrounding the island were. One of the few remaining descendants of the followers of Seath. Leon uses a dark crystal you find in the ruins of the High Elves to construct a new Holy Seat Sword, a sword to oppose darkness and Gyra's Bane, aptly named the Dark Slayer. Depending on how early you give Leon the stone, the sword could be stolen by the Pope upon completion. Either way, the Dark Slayer cannot be acquired before defeating him. Remember how I said that weapon spells are back? Well, if you use magic at a specific point in the sword swing animation, then the weapon will perform its secret magic attack. But there's more. In what almost appears to be a developer command and a brutal form of trolling, there is another, stronger ability that each magic weapon holds. To access it, all you need to do is press the attack, magic, and sprint buttons simultaneously. So in the Western release, square, triangle, and X. I don't know how anyone figured this out, because no one would intuitively just press this combination of buttons while standing still. Even the normal attack requires using magic at a specific moment during a sword swing. The static nature of this input is baffling, but with this, each weapon has a new ultimate attack, while the Seath Sword gives you an invincible block for zero MP cost with the detriment of the sword taking up the whole screen. There are a wide variety of cool-looking spells you can use if you find all of the elemental crystals, but between healing magic and the sword abilities, you won't have much use for them. Though an ill-suited use of MP, I have to agree, they're cool. Better to have than have not. Continuing on, you fight through a horde of demons and touch a floating blue cube, which promptly warps you to a cyber grid space. And now we have the biggest twist of the game. The so-called blue ship that fell to Melanot thousands of years ago was Gyra, the black dragon god himself. Deep within the island, he is imprisoned in a digital purgatory, which Aleph must navigate to finally banish the dread god and retrieve the holy sword. The monsters you encounter here have all been cybernetically modified. 
It seems Gyra wasn't only making demons in his lab, he was experimenting on them, upgrading them. In its final moments, Kingsfield II diverts into some weird territory. The evil sword and sorcery dragon god was actually a sci-fi alien scientist that fell to Earth. Ridiculous, you bet, but try to tell me that isn't insanely cool. The force King Alfred felt at work was Gyra all along. After tainting the jealous Pope's heart and ordering him to steal the Moonlight Sword, Gyra's ultimate plan was to lure King Alfred to the island so that he could be resurrected by his champion. Because, as it turns out, Gyra created the Sword of Moonlight as the ultimate weapon against his enemy Seath, the twin to the newly created Darkslayer. And with his true champion, King Alfred, he would resurrect and banish his age-old foe from this plane of existence. So now we understand why the Seath worshippers changed history with their inaccurate legends. Gyra was the dragon who presented the Moonlight Sword to the Dragon of the Forest, so it was a champion of the so-called Evil God who saved Verdite. If so, what were they fighting? From where did these monsters originate? if Gyra was operating as a force of good. Much like a hero in a Greek tragedy, Aleph stepped in and threw a wrench in Gyra's plan, taking Alfred's place and siding with Seath, forging a holy sword and taking the fight straight to Gyra inside his pocket dimension prison. You could fight Gyra however you like. You could use the Dark Slayer and its powerful magic, or you could shoot him with arrows whatever floats your boat. Or you could juke Gyra and get behind him, stealing the Moonlight Sword to use it in the battle. This is completely intended, by the way, all by design. A neat little in-game secret. A flaw still running through the heart of the series is the fact that you can still just kind of tank hits and use items to beat everything. Gyra is an interesting boss fight, being aided by little balls of light that shoot you with spells. But players who stocked up before challenging him don't even need to evade his attacks. You can just stand still and shoot him with your sword magic until he dies. In these early games, surviving the start and searching the area is the challenge. As by the late game, players are so overpowered that the bosses are easy. And sadly, you don't feel any sense of pride in defeating them. I didn't vanquish Gyra. I bullied him. To no one's surprise, the Sword of Moonlight is still insanely powerful, making quick work of Gyra and sending him blasting off into the stratosphere. Roll credits. Aleph returns to Verdite a hero, but is conflicted with everything he has learned in his journey. Meanwhile, the twin swords are locked away as holy relics. Once again, since the Sword of Moonlight is a central element to the plot, it's hard to miss. Though I suppose, despite its prominence, its actual acquisition is a secret. So how did the West take to Kingsfield? Surprisingly, reviewers still called the movement slow. In fact, this was the biggest criticism across the board. They felt that the enemies were too fast for the slow-moving player. Good thing they didn't have to play the first game. That was slow-paced. From Software's signature meticulous combat took some fire as well, being constantly referred to as a more boring Doom clone with a sword. Beyond the first-person dungeon crawler aspect, I don't fully know how these two have anything to do with one another. Ironic that journalists called every first-person game a Doom-like, when just two decades later, Every game with a smidgen of difficulty was referred to as a Souls-like. I guess some things never change. The most reasonable criticism came from GamePro magazine, where Kingsfield was put up against its contemporary, the 3DO's Death Keep. Once again, Kingsfield's bare-bones systems hurt its credibility as an RPG, being easily outshined by a licensed Dungeons & Dragons game that had classes and functioning stats. But at least it was on the PlayStation, 
as no one has or ever will own a 3DO. Only an editor recommendation, not even a written review, referenced Kingsfield's relation to Ultima Underworld, also listing the VR feel as Kingsfield 2's greatest feature. Shame we didn't get their review. This editor actually knew what they were talking about. Regardless, despite the petty comparisons, Kingsfield 2 was well-liked, which is surprising considering I had never heard the name Kingsfield until the 2001 release of the fourth game. It's impressive how much From Software improved upon the original in just a few months' time, especially without much constructive feedback from the public. For fans of the first game, the feeling of overcoming adversity is still present, and for those keen on exploration, the island of Melanot offers much more than a closed-off crypt, though expect to wander aimlessly for most of the game. Putting it simply, this sequel isn't merely a new coat of paint, but a grand stride towards From Software's dream of the ultimate action RPG. I feel that I can only recommend this to the most diehard of gaming historians, due to its relegation to the PlayStation 1, as it's probably a little too much for casual modern-day fans. But if you can get past its age, well, then you're in for a good time, provided you have the patience required to survive the beachfront. Though the English translation muddles the lore somewhat, it's nothing major compared to the fanfiction they wrote in the Chronicles of Verdite that originates from the English strategy guides. Ugh. Or what they did to three. Kingsfield 3 had the longest development time to date, exactly 11 months. Fresh off of the success of the first two games, the budget was larger than ever. So what better than to splurge a little? There was a TV advertisement, as well as the addition of FMV cutscenes, the hottest commodity of the time. In a bid to make the final chapter in the Kingsfield trilogy go out with a bang, from Software primarily focused their efforts on expanding the size of the game's world. In Kingsfield 1, you roamed a five-floor dungeon. In Kingsfield 2, you wandered the island of Melanot. But in Kingsfield 3, players have the entire country of Verdite to explore. As with the design of Zam's K3, From Software's dreams were a bit unrealistic for 1996, attempting to basically make a fully functioning sandbox adventure game despite the limitations of the PlayStation 1's hardware. If the technology was there, they would have attempted to create something that looked like Skyrim. Of course, the technology wasn't, but they tried to do it anyway. And to meet their goal of a fully explorable outside world, certain drawbacks were required. First, the PlayStation 1's famous black nebula straw distance came into play. Trees and ghosts are now flat 2D images, and while the trees are forgivable, the ghosts are almost impossible to see. Considering these ghosts shoot curses at you, which half your stats for a time, while also giving the screen a disgusting yellow tint, the fact that they're nearly invisible will frustrate you to no end. The third and worst concession was locking the game's frame rate at 15. From Software is no stranger to the practice of locking frame rates, but I know this will be too much for some people. It's an old game. If you can get past everything else, you can survive gaming at 15 frames. With the niche success of Kingsfield 2 in the West, the American publisher did what they did best back in the day. They took all the credit. Gone is the From Software logo animation. A deafening, ASCII logo takes center stage with the creator relegated to a From Software Presents. It really sickens me, reading all the old fan responses, wishing for ASCII to make another Kingsfield, though it doesn't surprise me when their PR used language such as ASCII plans to include more villages and outside scenery, more townsfolk, more enemies, or 
Of course, ASCII didn't stop there, with all the other enhancements carefully being added in. Who knows what else ASCII will think of before the game is done. When it comes to translating, things are worse than ever. Immediately, red flags shot up when I saw that two team members were nicknamed David the Commander of Silviera and Austin the Prince, Leiniger, as the protagonist, Lyle Ulysses Forrester, and the commander, Rodham Ward, were renamed Austin Lyle Forrester and Commander Silviera. Other NPCs were named after notable users on ASCII's internet forums. Rewriting the Japanese script was a blast, quoth Austin. It was an opportunity to actually create an entire script for a video game only limited by the original storyline from Japan. The arrogance of these localizers, I swear. Thankfully, the story wasn't completely gutted. It seems that he mostly only added asinine jokes to every NPC's bios. I am aware of ASCII's circumstances. In reality, they had no Japanese translators on staff, relying on a third party to translate their games in a one-and-done, slipshod manner. Anything that was left untranslated, or unintelligible, was simply filled in with something ASCII made up. And with their only contact with From Software, being back-and-forth emails, neither side could read without a translator. I understand their plight. I do. But with their earlier credit-taking behavior, it's hard to forgive this sin, even if they didn't know any better at the time. Changing gears, let's hear the real story. Returning a hero from his adventures on Melanot, Prince Aleph restored the Moonlight Sword to Verdite, offering the Dark Slayer as an additional gift. Now that the Dark Dragon Gyra was no more, both swords were sealed away in the castle tower. Hopefully, there would be no need for them. A few days later, on a rainy night, a large thunderstorm boomed overhead. That very night, King Alfred collapsed. Everyone feared for his life, for the sudden illness had cut down the strong hero king, rendering him a frail old man. But just as quickly as it came, the sickness left, and Alfred recovered. But something had changed within him. The king was no longer the just, kindly ruler, beloved by all. Aleph noticed the change immediately. Alfred's eyes were cold, lacking any hint of love or light. This was not the man he called brother. With time, monsters arose and terrorized Verdite, while Alfred ruled the people like a cruel tyrant. Prince Aleph was pressured to stand against his friend, but he could not. It was not until news reached him that the Sword of Moonlight had been shattered, presumably by the king's hand, that Aleph took action, knowing that Alfred had truly gone mad. Using the broken Forrester family sword as a catalyst, Aleph, with the aid of the country's four archmages, performed a powerful spell. In a burst of magic, Prince Aleph gave his life the fuel the ritual required to seal the mad king within his castle. With his dying breath, Aleph set down a new prophecy. Before the power of the seal faded, Aleph's son, Lyle Ulysses Forrester, would inherit the power of the four archmages and save the country. He must grow strong and accept the fate of defeating his father, who was once so beloved. With the castle sealed and the land crawling with evil, Lyle and his family were taken in by a friend of Aleph's, a man the prince had met on Melanot, the half-elf, Leo Shore. For ten years, monsters ruled Verdite. Death and misery were a fact of life. Few survived. Even the queen and Lyle's brother were taken. Now a seventeen-year-old, Lyle must face the destiny that was decided for him so long ago. So not a novel like the last game, but still an important bit of information to know before beginning. There's not much to say about the gameplay this time. Kingsfield 3 is the culmination of everything From Software wanted to put into an adventure game. But with how much they refined everything in 2, 
not much has changed in terms of gameplay. Circle strafing will always be a way of life. Players can control the same spells from two, with elements, light, fire, water, wind, and earth returning. Spells range in power from one, the weakest, to five legendary spells. The magic crystal acquisition method is gone, instead opting for giving each element an individual stat, with new spells being learned at certain milestones. I'm split on this decision. On one hand, increased use of a certain element will only serve to make it stronger, allowing players the freedom to use what they like. The drawback here is that instead of finding the spells, you need to level every element stat to 100 to unlock the most powerful of spells, which, while achievable, can easily become a grind. What's more, if you don't like the first spell of an element, and therein use it less, you won't learn any new spells in that category, creating an infinite loop of element neglect. To combat this, hidden across Verdite are elemental crystals that give you a plus three to the matching element. These are a big help, but it requires finding almost all of them to make it to 100 with all five elements. In contrast, the player's strength stat seems to grow like wildfire giving you a level about every 40 hits. And since you will primarily use weapons over magic, this will reach ridiculous levels in-game. Magic weapons return, and they're the worst they've ever been. Well, they aren't bad. No, they're as overpowered as ever. This time, instead of requiring a certain stat to unlock, they require you to meet that same condition, and then and only then, will an NPC teach you the ability. Yep, the weapons just won't work until an NPC says, How about a lesson? Gives you a glowing screen, and then replies with, That's about all I can teach you. Hilariously, nothing in-game tells you what just happened. But now you can perform level 1 magic attacks. Yes, there are levels. Level 1 weapon magic pertains to the average slash than shoot attack by casting magic at a specific time during the weapon's arc. Some weapons have a highly specific window to perform their spells. For instance, I could only pull off the Vaculacia Sword's ability once. No way I could reliably use it in battle. To unlock the final level 2 abilities, players must finish a rather cryptic NPC questline. These level 2 abilities are the same ones that required pressing the three buttons simultaneously in 2, but they change the input. This time, players must piano the buttons, pressing run, then attack, then magic, in quick succession, x, then square, then triangle. I knew the ability existed, and I even looked up a guide when I couldn't get it to work and it still took minutes of fumbling around with the inputs to figure things out. An interesting addition, and one I would like to see return someday, is a menu that tracks conversations, cataloged according to character. Very handy when figuring out some of the puzzles. I don't know why this feature was never revisited. At the start, Kingsfield 3 has the same classic from software hands-off approach. Leon pushes Lyle out of the nest, nudging him to set out to face his destiny. All we know is that we must find the four Archmages, and three pieces to something called the Icarus Key. And with that, we are free to wander the open world and fight monsters. Lyle's starting weapon is a magic sword Leon crafted called the X-Selector, which allegedly gains power as you use it. Thankfully, this isn't completely the case, and it will level up according to your total experience gained, whether you use it or leave it to sit in your inventory. This is a decent storyline weapon for the protagonist. It's not very good at level 1, but its level 2 and 3 forms are formidable when you get them mid-game. Though a large world, Verdite is mostly locked off at the beginning. 
forcing players to complete a few key early areas before being allowed to wander into in-game zones. But once unlocked, this open nature gives players the option to tackle harder areas earlier, to gain more experience and stronger gear. You won't be able to go to the castle just yet, but depending on the path taken, meeting the four Archmages and the acquisition of the key pieces will happen at the player's whim. Fitting with the large map, there are a lot of NPCs, though admittedly few for a country. This is explained by the dire state of the last ten years. Under the rule of King Alfred, most of Verdite's population has been slaughtered by monsters. Only communities with strong defenses, or stronger warriors, have lived up to this point, and reasonably they have no love lost for the royal family. As he continues his adventure, as well as by helping them out with side quests from time to time. Lyle slowly proves himself in the eyes of the survivors. You become the only hope for these people. Suddenly, now that they trust you, Lyle is burdened with becoming a better king than his father. A primary focus in this final chapter is Lyle's position as a put-upon hero. We never get to hear his thoughts, but given that he was chosen to become the hero that would one day slay his father at the age of seven, there is room for hesitation. After losing his mother and brother to monsters, he would surely be ready to avenge them by traveling the countryside, rescuing villages, and being the hero he wished would have been there for his family. But as a 17-year-old, while playing hero and saving people is invigorating, the looming reality that everyone expects him to kill his father and become the next hero king is no doubt a sobering one. We witness death and loss more than ever in this game, but in the end, we can only imagine what an impact this journey has had on Lyle. One of the NPCs we run into is a young woman named Mina, Lyle's childhood friend. Lyle's tanned, tomboy elf, childhood friend, who may or may not have obvious feelings for him. In all of the From Software games I've played, this is the first time I've come across a character like this. Odds she lives through all this? The FMVs or full motion videos used throughout the game are seamlessly merged with interactions to add a cinematic magic to the limitations of the PS1. Meeting the Archmages, opening certain areas, and facing off against King Alfred, all feature in FMV. When, in a time before Final Fantasy VII, many games only sparingly use them as opening and ending bookends. The decision to try to make them seamlessly meld into the game is interesting. FMVs were typically used as cutscenes, but due to being animated by an isolated person or team, they often focused on spectacle and cool factor, using broad strokes to connect themselves to the story due to the medium's long development time. If something changed or was scrapped, then the FMV guy who had been animating an accompanying video for the last few weeks was left in the lurch. His time and the company's money wasted. But From Software's effort to make them a one to one match of the player's first person view is different. It's cool to immediately resume where the cutscene left off. There's less discrepancy between us, the player, and Lyle. We are there step by step with Lyle the entire journey. We, the player, are. Lyle, Ulysses Forrester. Having an entire country to explore means more monsters, more traps, and more secrets to be found. Graphically, looking better than ever, with a wider texture palette to give areas less of an identical, copy-paste feel. Kingsfield 3 is the ultimate experience thus far. Secret passages are everywhere, and while monster noises might alert players to a handful of them, the majority require the age-old, 
grinding your face against every flat surface you come across. Does it take you out of the action? Sure. Is it lame? You bet. But it's the only way to find everything, without backtracking, with an item found in the final castle area. Gone are the pre-drawn maps of past games. Now, players travel with the ever-handy pixie map, a magical piece of parchment that notes down everywhere you've been. It won't guide you anywhere, as it can only see what you've seen, but it will keep you from getting lost in some of the dungeons. Much better than having to draw your own map, right? Speaking of dungeons, the core of the adventuring will be done in dungeons that dot the countryside. Besides a few open-ended areas, these dungeons are isolated zones that dead end, allowing players to carry out a clear search and seizure approach to dungeon raiding. Unlike Kingsfield 2, there will be no aimless backtracking to find a forgotten locked door, as almost all of the areas branch off of the central countryside zone. So it's just a matter of hopping from dungeon to dungeon. No hassle. No backtracking to progress. The only things left behind are locked chests containing gems, money, or gear. So make note and circle back whenever you pick up a new key. Rhombus keys are reborn as Rodham keys, and are thankfully reduced in their function to trap unwitting players. Limited to only the barracks, these keys unlock a variety of decent gear, should the player collect all of the commander's scattered keys. The one grip I have is that while once again there are no loading screens, From Software knew that they were onto a good thing, and instead of the two or three loading corridors in Kingsfield 2, the large map of three is interconnected with empty, often questionably foliage-covered pathways that hide the loading between zones. A telltale sign of entering a new area, the BGM slowly fades out, switching to the track of the newly entered zone. A little clumsy, but I suppose with the size of the game's world, this was the only way to operate free from the confines of loading screens. A common feature in From Software games are poison zones. Kingsfield 1 didn't have a dedicated area, but it did have certain enemies that would poison you. I particularly remembered the lizard men with the poison-coated swords. Kingsfield 2 contained similar enemies, but had an entire mine filled with poison gas, from which you must save an NPC. I am happy to inform you that in Kingsfield 3, the entire game is a poison area. The mushrooms, poison. The shooty flower guys, poison. The lizard men, poison. These Naga women. Poison. And this lava river. No, that's actually a poison river. This is what the lava river looks like. Seriously, when I first saw this, I left, thinking that you needed some item to cross, or that I had to stem the flow of lava somewhere else. But no, it's just poison that you need to run through that quickly depletes your health bar, as if you're stepping on video game lava. Once I found the anti-poison ring, I wore it the entire game and never looked back. There's just too much poison in this game, and constantly losing health to status effects gets old. One of Lyle's objectives is locating the Archmages to learn magic. This is done by stepping onto a sigil, which transports you to a pocket dimension or something, where they will teach you their element. At first, I thought they were hiding in these warp zones, until I met the water archmage at the lake. The lake is covered in small islands that can be linked together with a magic water bridge. These bridges do not appear unless Lyle is wearing magic water boots that are hidden somewhere else in the game. To make things better, the bridges rotate around the islands and must be controlled by a switch that the water archmage is gatekeeping, requiring a toll every time you want to move the bridges. When you finally find the usual portal to the Archmage on one of the islands, she teaches you water magic, then disappears from the world, allowing unlimited access to the switch. 
So I suppose the Archmages are ghosts. Really, I don't know. The Icreus keys, on the other hand, were left under the protection of three guardians, all of whom either lost them or are currently deceased. For some reason, these keys teleport players to a specific fountain. The English version wasn't clear on why. Once all three keys are collected, players must trek back to Leon's house, where he will reforge the original Icreus key, at the cost of Lyle's level 3 X selector. This is needed to unlock a very important area, and while a major blow to your mid-game strength, there are better weapons later on. Returning to Leon, you find the completed key and a note, saying that Leon is going somewhere to aid Lyle behind the scenes. With the completed Icreus key, players can teleport to fountains across the country from the menu. At no cost, too. Very handy for those that wish to clear everything before moving on to the castle. Like everything with this game, the soundtrack is bigger and better than ever, packed with 24 great pieces that give a unique character to the fantastical vistas traveled. Koji Endo and Kaoru Kono return for a final time and knock it out of the park. Many of the tracks are immediately iconic, from the organs of Quist to the haunting melody of the High Elves. Whether you played this back in the day or just finished it for the first time, listening to the soundtrack, each song will immediately resurface from some forgotten corner of your mind. I didn't realize there were this many amazing tracks in the game, but even when occupied with combat and exploration, they stick in your mind. Truly a memorable soundtrack. A nice send-off for both the Kingsfield Trilogy and Sound Kids. Koji Endo and his company would only go on to write for one last game, 1997's Koi no Summer Fantasy in Miyazaki C. Gaia for the Sega Saturn a promotional tie-in dating sim for the defunct Seagaya Ocean Dome, where players take idol Megumi Okina to the water park for a date. Fortunately, though their last outing in gaming, Sound Kids went on to write for movies and television, and unlike Seagaya, are still in business today. Everything I can mention pertaining to the story is a spoiler. So here's your warning. Skip ahead if you wish. Transitioning from idols at water parks, our buddy Leon, the elf craftsman who always had a wonder weapon for us, is dead. In forging us a much needed warp device, Leon gave his life to complete the Icreus key. His grave can be found nearby, next to Queen Noel and Lyle's brother, though I don't know who moved his body from his house and buried him. Magic, probably. Now that we're discussing spoilers, we can talk about Mina, the childhood friend. Always worried for Lyle's safety, Mina will travel across the country, popping up in new areas Lyle discovers, running a shop to keep Lyle in top condition. Yeah. She doesn't help for free. Lyle wouldn't get any stronger, relying on handouts. Besides aiding Lyle, Mina's secondary goal is to locate her father, who was once a friend of King Alfred's. It's clear to both Mina and the player that he's most likely dead. Eventually, players will find Mina missing, a note left behind. She has ventured ahead to find the piece of the Icreus key her father once held. Anyone that knows From Software at this point knows her fate. You find her body just meters from the key. Taking a ring she carried that Aleph gave her, Lyle continues on his quest. Oh, and to any bow guys, she's your only source of purchasable arrows. I'm sorry. Another key figure in the vast history of Kingsfield is the mysterious mage Orladine, the teacher of both Zedek and Shaddam from Kingsfield 2. Orladine was known as Fickle, 
a trickster by nature, leaving various traps and puzzles around the world. The water bridges and boots were his doing as well. But when you finally discover his lost stronghold, beyond the ruins of the High Elves, well, you come face to face with the man himself. Despite being a disciple of the High Elf, Icarus, and the most powerful mage ever known, Orladine also had a destiny to fulfill. Icarus told him that the ultimate purpose of his existence was to grant all of his power to the hero that would one day right the balance of the world. In all his greatness, Orladine was only a stepping stone for another, not even as a teacher, but as a receptacle for power. Distraught, Orladine lost the will to live. He sat alone in his stronghold, and there he still sits, a skeleton, waiting for Lyle. The biggest insult is that someone has stolen his head and stuck it in a chest. Because of this, and the fact that returning the skull acts as a key, playing an FMV and opening a secret chamber, players can actually walk past the skeleton, thinking it only a prop to open the door. Orladine has sat for centuries, waiting for the release from his pointless existence, and players can just ignore him and leave his destiny unfulfilled. Sad, really. Within the chamber is a large version of the dragon tree players respawn at whenever they die holding a dragon tree fruit. The room appears empty, but players can talk to the tree to learn the final piece missing from the picture. At the beginning of time, the god Silval created the world, Valicia. Three sub-gods were created to nurture the planet. Elwyn controlled the sea, Elphos the sky, and Valid the earth. After their tasks were done, Elwyn and Elphos returned to the realm of their creator. But Valid lingered. Wanting to play god a little himself, Valid created the elves and dwarves, then he filled the planet with all manner of creatures. The final race he created was man. But Valid quickly lost control of the humans, who had begun to act as humans do, warring, conquering, and dominating all life on Belicia. So Valid sent two envoys, Seath and Gyra, to guide the humans. Regrettably, Seath and Gyra too lost their way. Forgetting their mission, they got swept up in the humans' worship, developing an intense rivalry that would define their existence. Seath was viewed as the shining god of light, the object of humanity's love and adoration, while Gyra was viewed as the evil god of darkness, the focus of all of humanity's hatred. Both sides raised armies of monsters that only served to farther the hatred and bloodshed this being blamed solely on Gyra. Which brings us to today, the origin of the destiny that passed from Icarus to Orladine to Lyle, was Valid himself. Receiving the powerful Icarus armor set, Lyle now realizes the truth of the world. Both Gyra and Seath must be destroyed to allow any sort of peace. The world's current apocalyptic state comes from the actions of Aleph in 2. The second game does everything it can to convince players Seath is good. He is the origin of the fountains that heal the player. Statues that revive the players are in some likeness of his. And more importantly, every villager is a devout worshipper of the Light God. Besides one NPC, who says he doesn't altogether trust either of the Dragon Gods, everything points the player towards the mentality of Seath equals good, Gyra equals bad. Despite everything that happened in the first game, where Gyra had his own healing fountain and gifted the player the Sword of Moonlight and Forest Armor to defeat the Sorcerer King, the plot of the second game still succeeds in convincing players that Gyra is evil. Tragically, thinking himself on the side of good, Aleph aided Seath in slaying Gyra ridding the world of its evil god. But as we have learned, the two dragons were not good and evil, but originally a sort of yin-yang balance. 
Now, Lyle must write that balance. Standing at the castle gates, the time has come for Lyle to confront his father and save the world. But what is an ending without a final bit of tragedy? After adventuring across the doomed country of Verdite for 20 plus hours, players have likely forgotten the specifics of the introduction in the instruction booklet. Well, in a twist from most NPCs, you meet a woman who has a grudge not with the king, but Prince Aleph. For when he sealed the king, he also trapped every servant and soldier within the castle for these last ten years. The woman's fiancé was one of those poor souls. Fortunately for Lyle, her fiancé held two important keys, one of which he left behind with his love. The tragedy here, the woman you talk to never gives you the key, for it is found a short distance away in the cemetery, atop her grave. When Lyle returns, her ghost is gone. Classic from software. To better understand this next part, let me shift gears for a second. A few months after Kingsfield 3's release, the Tokyo Game Show was held on August 22nd, 1996. During the show, From Software handed out a promotional disc called Kingsfield Pilot Style. Unlike most demo discs of the era, this wasn't a glimpse at a small section of the game itself, but completely new, though short, content. Taking place between the events of Kingsfield 2 and Kingsfield 3, just after the sealing of King Alfred and the death of Prince Aleph, pilot style is the short story of Commander Rodham Ward, the former captain of Verdite's Royal Guard, returning from retirement in a quest to reclaim the Moonlight Sword. The legend of the commander is frequently retold by the survivors of Verdite. In his reclamation of the Holy Sword, Commander Rodham became a hero, a beacon of hope. Unable to wait for the time of the prophecy, the commander gathered all who would follow him and traveled to the castle to face the king himself. And this was years ago, and no one has heard from him or his followers since. As according to tradition, a night or two stayed behind, lamenting their fate, waiting for a day where they can redeem themselves and die fighting like their fallen comrades. Something that bothers me is that unlike most other characters, there is no grave or corpse of the commander to be found. It is confirmed he made it to the castle gates, as he left the Moonlight Sword at Aleph's grave, but his trail ends there. It's obvious that he's dead, but I would have liked some sort of closure to his legend. Breaking the seal on the prince's tombstone, Lyle grabs the broken sword and finally sets foot on castle ground. As I said earlier, there's a second NPC players must find to learn level 2 weapon magic. Well, in the castle gardens sits the dragon fountain from Kingsfield 1. It seems that Alfred was fond of the old thing after his adventure in the sanctuary, so he somehow had it dragged up to the surface as the focal point of the gardens. Players must toss the ring retrieved from Mina's body into the fountain, which summons Prince Aleph's ghost. I understand that you're probably just merely using the ring near the fountain, but since it's removed from your inventory, it seems funnier to imagine Lyle throwing it into the fountain. Mina mentions offhand that Aleph gave her the ring as a child, telling her that no matter where he is, the ring will allow her to speak to him if she visited the Dragon Fountain. And while I don't understand why it works like this, power of Gyra maybe, Aleph is summoned. He reiterates on his dying words, and teaches Lyle the ultimate magic required to breeze through the rest of the game. I feel really bad for Orladine, the most powerful mage in history, and even his level 5 spells, pale in comparison to sword magic learned from a prince. So, with our ridiculous strength stat, and the power of our magic swords, we enter the castle proper. With entry to most of the castle locked, requiring the two keys, the only way forward is down. While searching the castle dungeons, we find the fiancé. Against all odds, he and a comrade have survived for ten years on stale food. 
an admittedly humorous embellishment by Askey, no doubt. With Lyle here, he rejoices on their rescue. Soon the land will be saved, and he could return to his blushing bride-to-be. He notices that Lyle carries her key, and while Lyle admits to speaking with her, he doesn't have the heart to reveal the truth. Sad. Of course, the other soldier who survived the entire ten years, who just went out to scavenge for more food, is found dead a short distance away. One day too late. Unlocking the door, the rest of the castle is swarming with bipedal dragons, who the truth mirror refers to as more powerful than King Alfred, but for some unknown reason, follow him all the same. So after slaying a horde of fire drakes, and releasing a group of possessed knights from their eternal servitude, Lyle reaches the throne room, and an FMV begins the final battle. Disappointingly, King Alfred doesn't recognize his son, and instead comes off as stereotypically evil, clearly possessed by some outside force. Wielding the Dark Slayer, he begins his attack, but armed with the trusty Triple Fang, Lyle defeats the king in about 30 seconds. I wasn't joking when I said the boss fights are unfulfilling, what with how godlike you are by the end game. So with his father defeated, Lyle is crowned king, and the land is saved. Or so it would seem, until an all-familiar chill cast itself over the young king. Now with the same cold and human stare, darkness once again reigns over Verdite. Bad end. So Kingsfield 3 has two endings, this being an ending where players miss something, failing to heed the warnings given them, defeating Alfred but becoming possessed by the same mysterious yet obvious being that I'm struggling not to name outright. To unlock the true ending, players must explore the castle grounds instead of rushing straight to the castle. And what is probably the coolest part of the entire trilogy, a familiar doorway can be found nearby in a one-to-one -one recreation of the opening of Kingsfield 1, players discover the ancient entrance to the sanctuary of the Dragon of the Forest, and in stepping upon the sigil, are transported to the first floor. The thrill of returning to the sanctuary cannot be accurately described. After exploring the entire country of Verdite, I had no hope of returning to the legendary shrine of Game 1. But surprisingly, the entrance sits right next to the castle gardens, within arm's reach of the former Sorcerer King's seat of power. Everything is as it was, the secret wall with the skeleton and wooden shield, the locked chest with the Verdite gem. Half of the floor may be collapsed and inaccessible, but this is pure fan service. As stated in the intro of Kingsfield 2, all the NPCs are dead and gone, but the animated skeleton of the merchant Wilfred Wright still lives. According to Wright, a fraction of Gyra's power is lurking deep within the sanctuary, weak but fueled by the desire to restore the Sword of Moonlight so Seath can be vanquished. Farther into the first floor's corridors, there is a foe wearing a familiar set of armor. This is the undead hero, Mero Ol. Someone has resurrected this fallen champion and sent him to stamp out the last of Gyra's energy. Hmm, I wonder who. He's pretty weak, and you don't get his armor, but you can retrieve the Seath Sword. Not that it's any good. Stepping onto the warp pad that Meryl Ol was guarding, you are taken to the fifth floor. The demons are strong, but no match for the packload of gear Lyle's acquired throughout his journey. And that's it. We hit a dead end. You can return to the same place we fought King Reinhardt III, but there's nothing there. What makes the true ending difficult isn't finding the sanctuary, 
but figuring out what you need to do to locate Gyra. Obviously, this area is special, as Meryl all and a group of demons were guarding it. But what to do? Well, players must use a fossilized fairy, discovered in another area, hidden away by Orladine. Besides making the connection to Gyra being the creator of fairies, there's not much to go on to signal needing to use this fossil here. But that's the trial and error style of classic role-playing rearing its head, I suppose. The fairy-sized fairy is revived and magically creates a bridge, allowing players to cross the gap. Inside is the rather evil-looking core of the sanctuary, and with the last of Gyra's power, the Sword of Moonlight is reforged. Fight Alfred one more time, and you get a new scene. In a touching reunion, the ghost of Alfred congratulates his son on his growth, reiterating that the White Dragon Seath must fall to bring peace to the world. And one final act to make Orladine forever irrelevant. Alfred channels his energy into the Sword of Moonlight, creating some powered-up monstrosity that looks like it came out of an old MMO. As he fades away, he leaves Lyle with four words. I'm proud of you. And so we warp to Seath's realm, a black void with a moon texture. He doesn't look anything like you expected, huh? Though they share names, the Seath in Dark Souls is an actual dragon, where here he is some bipedal alien wearing gleaming armor. There's a slight angel aspect to his design, coming mainly from his wings, but the helmet tassel or ponytail makes me recall Fulgore from Killer Instinct. It's a long fight, but not necessarily a difficult one. With Seath defeated, the storm over Verdite subsides, and the monsters are destroyed. I'm not sure what this accomplishes, but Lyle stabs the ex selector into the castle sending a wave of blinding light across Verdite. With the country safe, Lyle looks over his kingdom. Content with leaving Lyle's line to guide humanity, Valid finally departs from our realm, allowing humans to rule without interference from the gods. And that is the legend of Verdite. Almost everyone died, but there is always hope. We will rebuild. Time moves on. A mythical tale set in a long-forgotten age of magic gives way to the age of mortals. A bittersweet note to part on, but one that satisfies the tone of From Software's storytelling. I know that this will rain on the small bit of joy the ending brings, but Aski, probably Prince Austin himself, felt that Mina's fate was uncalled for, and to brighten up the ending, valid before leaving randomly says Brightly does the fire of light burn within your heart off from Lyle Forrester Long have I waited for such a line to be born after quail the darkness born in the hearts of man and beasts alike As long as your line may reign you shall be known as the Golden Kings and peace shall reign in your world With the lesser paths of power coming into alliance there's no longer need of me I will finally return to Silvall your courage and vigilance has returned the light to your world. For this, I grant you back the life of your queen to be. The darkness enveloped Lynn's body, but her spirit remained pure to the light. Peace, Golden King. It's actually more depressing hearing this and knowing it to be untrue. I do like the overly dramatic evil voiceover for Valid, though. Can't help but laugh at it. Bid farewell to the Sword of Moonlight, enjoying its time in the spotlight. This is the last time for a long, long while that it will play any part in the story. Once again optional, and a secret, the Sword of Moonlight stands among the strongest swords in the game. Unlike the last game, PAL Regents never received Kingsfield 3. Presumably, there was some issue getting the game to run at 50 Hz so From Software decided it wasn't worth the hassle. Once again, Kingsfield was graced with glistening reviews, which, while often critical, still awarded an average of 8 or 8.5 out of 10. The combat is meticulous, 
The graphics are good, but not great. We've been through it all before. What was clear? Kingsfield 3 was more of what fans liked about Kingsfield 2, but with a larger world to play in. More bang for your buck. What's not to love? Kingsfield 4 notwithstanding, since 1996, there has never been another game quite like Kingsfield. From software made such great advancements as a game developer in these three short years. Developing a trilogy that I think, despite its age, is one of the best adventure series available in 3D. As an RPG it may be lacking, but as an explorative action game, it is near as perfect as the technology afforded. The precise combat, the thorough wall-hugging, from the piecemeal storytelling to the secrets, hidden away in a world that couldn't care less whether you found them or not. Everything comes together to form an experience that is unlike any other. Aspects of this will be carried down from game to game within From Software. But despite slight similarities, there is something that sets Kingsfield apart from its progeny. And I'm not talking the first person. There is something, a heart, within Kingsfield, that like the early Zelda games, does not exist in later titles. It is the collaboration of ideas from the team which lovingly crafted it, possible only within the perfect storm of ambition and naivete of a fledging developer. Opposed to the modern maxima from software, the story of Kingsfield is an odd one. Though clearly a bittersweet tale, each Kingsfield tells the story of the protagonist maturing into a hero. A son saves the kingdom, surpassing his father and becoming a man. A restless prince sets out on a quest and through good intentions dooms everything he holds dear. A youth, both a prince and a son, must right the wrongs of those that came before him, saving the realm, but losing everything along the way. Bittersweet though it may be, there is something lurking in the background, biding its time during the player's fumbling with the traps and monsters. Hope. And though things may seem grim, victory unattainable in the face of constant death, the hero always overcomes, evil is vanquished, and peace wins the day. Cliché, but refreshingly optimistic for From Software. It saddens me to think that due to its age, it's forgotten, ignored. But time moves on. New dynasties will always rise from the ashes of the past. Dark Souls gave way to Elden Ring, as Elden Ring will one day do for its successor. Names will fall into the annals of history, becoming footnotes in another's rise. This is how Kingsfield told its narrative. This is just how it is. I don't think there will ever be another Kingsfield, but there will, one day, be another like it. Speaking in broad terms. A slow-paced explorative action title, where the act of excavating the map like an archaeologist piecing together lost legends to paint the larger picture, is prioritized over fast-paced combat systems. It may not be exactly the classic sword and sorcery of the 20th century, but some new angle, colored by our ever-changing concept of fantasy today. I know this sounds like nitpicking, as most of the modern From Software library offers this in some degree. But what can I say? I like the atmosphere this specific mixture of elements brings. It will probably be a long while before first-person games become genre-defining juggernauts once again. Besides, if Bethesda manages it again. But if anyone can do it, it's from software. I wouldn't hold your breath during the wait, though. <laughs>